And we're going to continue with the miracle of Purin Bhagat. Not the most exciting story so far. A uh, rich Indian businessman, former prime minister, has gone up in the hills to beg. Everybody's very excited that he's there. And we'll pick up from that point. Every morning, the filled begging bowl was laid silently in the crutch of the roots outside the shrine. Sometimes the priest brought it, sometimes a Ladakhi trader lodging in the village and anxious to get merit trudged up the path, but more often it was the women, or it was the woman who would cook the meal overnight, and she would murmur hardly above her breath, Speak for me before the gods begot. Speak for such a one, the wife of so-and-so. Now and then, some bold child would be allowed the honor, and Purim Bhagat would hear him drop the bowl and run as fast as his legs could carry him. But the Bhagat never came down to the village. It was laid out like a map at his feet. He could see the evening gatherings held on the circle of, thre of the threshing floors, because that was the only level ground. could see the wonderful unnamed green of the young rice, the indigo blues of the Indian corn, the dock-like patches of buckwheat, and in its season the red bloom of the amaranth, whose tiny seeds bring neither grain nor pulse, make a fool that can be lawfully eaten by Hindus in time of fe in time of fast, make a food that can be lawfully eaten by Hindus in time of fast. When the year turned, the roots of the huts were all square were all little squares of the purest gold, for it was on the roofs that they had laid out their cobs of the corn to dry. Hiving and harvest, rice sowing and husking, passed before his eyes, all embroidered down there on the many-sided plots of fields, and he thought of them all, and wondered what they all led to at the long last. Even in populated India, a man cannot a day sit still before the wild things run over him as though he were a rock, and in that wilderness very soon the wild things knew Kali's shrine well, came back to look at the intruder. The langurs, the big gray whiskered monkeys of the Himalayas, were naturally the first, for they are alive with curiosity, and when they had upset the begging bowl and rolled it round the floor and tried their teeth on the brass-handled crutch and made faces at the antelope skin, they decided that the human who sat so still was harmless. At evening, they would leap down from the pines and beg with their hands for things to eat, and then swing off in graceful curves. They liked the warmth of the fire, too, and huddled round it, till Purin Bhagat had to push them aside to throw on more fuel. And in the morning, as often as not, he would find a furry ape sharing his blanket. All day long, one or the other of the tribe would sit by his side, staring out at the snows crooning and looking unspeakably wise and sorrowful. After the monkeys came the Bara Singh, the big deer, which is like our red deer, but stronger. He wished to rub off the velvet of his horns against the cold stones of Kali's statue, and stamped his feet when he saw the man at the shrine. But Purin Bhagat never moved, and little by little the royal stag edged up and nuzzled his shoulder. Purin Bhagat slid one cool hand along the hot antlers, and the touch soothed the fretted beast, who bowed his head, and Purin Bhagat very softly rubbed and raveled off the velvet. Afterwards, the Bara Singh brought his doe and fawn, gentle things that mumbled on the holy man's blanket, or would come alone at night, his eyes green in the fire flicker, to take his share of fresh walnuts. At last, the musk deer, the shyest and almost the smallest, of the deerlets came too, her big rabbity ears erect, even brindled, silent, mushik nabla, nabha, must needs find out what the light in the shrine meant, and drop her moose-like nose into Purim Bhagat's lap, coming and going with the shadows of the fire. Purim Bhagat called them all my brothers, and his low call of, Baha'i, Baha'i, would draw them from the forest at noon, as they were within earshot, if they were within earshot. The Himalayan black bear, moody and suspicious, Sana, who has the V-shaped white mark under his chin, passed that way more than once, and since the begot showed no fear, Sana showed no anger, but watched him and came closer, 
and begged a share of the caresses and a dole of the bread or wild berries. Often, in the still draws, when the bagot would climb to the very crest of the pass to watch the red day waking, to watch the red day walking along the peaks of the snows, he would find Sona shuffling and grunting at his heels, thrusting a curious forepaw under tree trunks and bringing it away with a woof of impatience, or his early steps would wake Sona, where he lay curled up, and the great bruise, the great brute, rising erect, would think to fight till he heard the Bagat's voice and knew his best friend. Nearly all hermits and holy men who live apart from the big cities have the reputation of being able to work miracles with the wild things. But all the miracle lies in keeping still and never making a hasty movement, and for a long time at least, in never looking directly at a visitor. The villagers saw the outline of the Bara Singh stalking like a shadow through the dark forest behind the shrine, saw the mineral, the Himalayan pheasant, blazing her best colors before Kali's shrine, and the langurs on their haunches inside playing with the walnut shells. Some of the children, too, had heard Sana singing to himself, bear fashion, behind the tree rock, behind the fallen rocks, and the Bagat's reputation as a miracle worker stood firm. Yet nothing was farther from his mind than miracles. He believed that all things were one big miracle, and when a man knows that much, he knows something to go upon. He knew, for a certainty, that there was nothing great and nothing little in this world, and day and night he strove to think out his way into the heart of things. Back to the place whence his soul had come. So thinking, he un his untrimmed hair fell down about his shoulders. The stone slab at the side of the antelope skin was dented into a little hole by the foot of his brass-handled crutch, and the place between the tree trunks where the begging bowl rested day after day sunk and worn into a hollow almost as smooth as the brown shell itself. And each beast knew his exact place at the fire. The fields changed their colors with the seasons. The threshing floors filled and emptied and filled again and again. And again and again the winter came. The langurs frisked among the branches, feathered with light snow, till the mother monkeys brought their sad-eyed little babies up from the warmer valleys with the spring. There were few changes in the village. The priest was older, and many of the little children who used to come with the begging dish sent their own children now. And when you asked of the villagers how long their holy men had lived in Kali's shrine at the head of the pass, they answered, Always. Then came such summer rains as had not been known in the hills for many seasons. Through three good months the valley was wrapped in cloud and soaking mist, steady, unrelenting downfall, breaking off into the th into thunder shower after thunder shower. Kali's shrine stood above the clouds for the most part, and there was a whole month in which the Bagat never caught a glimpse of his village. It was packed away under the a white floor of cloud, and swayed and shifted and rolled on itself and bulged upward, but never broke from its piers the streaming flanks of the valley. All that time he heard nothing but the sound of a million little waters overheard from the trees and underfoot, overhead from the trees, and underfoot along the ground, soaking through the pine needles, dripping through the tongues of draggled fern, and spouting in newly torn muddy channels down the slopes. Then the sun came out and drew forth the good incense of the deodars, from the and the rhododendrons, and that far off, clean smell, which the hill people call the smell of the snows, the hot sunshine lasted for a week, and then the rains gathered together for their last downpour, and the water fell in sheets that flayed off the skin of the ground and leaked back in the, mi in the mud. Purin Bagat heaped his fire high that night, for he was sure his brothers would need warmth, but never a beast came to the shrine. So he called and called till he dropped asleep, wondering what had happened in the woods. It was in the black heart of the night, the rain drumming like a thousand drums, that he was roused by a plucking at his blanket, and stretching out, felt the little hand of a langur. It is better here than in the trees, he said sleepily, loosening a fold of blanket. Loosening a fold of blanket. Take it and be warm, the monkey caught his hand and pulled hard. Is it food then? said Purin Bagat. Wait a while, and I will prepare some. 
and he kneeled to throw fuel on the fire. The langer ran to the door of the shrine, crooned, and ran back again, plucking at the man's knee. What is it? What is thy trouble, brother? said Perrin Bagat, for the langer's eyes were full of things that he could not tell. Unless one of thy case be in a trap, and none such traps here, I will not go into that weather. Look, brother, even the Bada Singh comes for shelter. The deer's antlers clashed as he strode into the shrine, clashed against the grinning statue of Kali. He lowered them, in Perrin Bagat's direction, and stamped uneasily, hissing through his half shut through his half shut nostrils. Hi, hi, hi! Said the Bagat, snapping his fingers. Is this payment for a night's lodging? But the deer pushed him toward the door, and as he did so, the Purim Bagat heard the sound of something opening with a sigh and saw two slabs of the floor drawn away from, from each other, while the sticky earth below smacked its lips. No, I see, said Purim Bagat. No blame to my brothers that you did not sit by the fire tonight. The mountain is falling, and yet, why should I go? His eye fell on the empty begging bowl, and his face changed. They have given me food daily since I came, and if I am not swift tomorrow, there will be no, there will be not one mouth in the valley. Indeed, I must go and warn them below. Back there, brother. Let me get to the fire. The bar of Singh backed unwillingly as Perrin Bagat drove a pine torch into the flame, twirling it till it was well lit. Ah, he came to warn me, he said, rising. Better than that we shall do. Better than that. Out now, and lend me thy neck, brother, for I have but two feet. Clutched the bristling with he crutched, he clutched the bristling withers of the Bara Singh with his right hand, held the torch away for with his left, and stepped out of the shrine into the desperate night. There was no breath of wind, but the rain nearly drowned the flare as the great deer hurried down the slope, sliding on its haunches. As soon as they were clear of the forest, more of the Bagat's brothers joined them. He heard them, though he could not see the langurs pressing about him and behind him the woo hoo of Sona. The rain matted his long white hair into ropes, the water splashed beneath his bare feet, and his yellow robe clung to his frail old body, but he stepped down steadily, leaning against the Bara Singh. He was no longer a holy man, but Sir Purin Das, K-C-I-E, -K Prime Minister of no small state, a man accustomed to command, going out to save life. Down the steep, plashy path, they poured all together, the Bagat and his brothers, down and down till the deer's feet clicked and stumbled on the wall of a, th of, a th of a threshing floor. And he snorted, because he smelt man. Now they are at the head of the one crooked village street, and the Bagat beat with his crutch on the barred windows of the blacksmith's house as his torch blazed up in the shelter of the eaves. Up and out, cried Purim Bagat. And he did not know his own voice, for it was years since he had spoken aloud to a man. The hill falls, the hill is falling, up and out, O you within. It is our begot, said the blacksmith's wife. He stands among the beasts. Gather the little ones and give the call. It ran from house to house while the beasts cramped in the narrow way, surged and huddled round the begot, and Sona puffed impatiently. The people hurried into the street. They were no more than seventy souls in all, souls all told, and in the glare of the torches they saw their begot holding back the terrified Bara Singh while the monkeys plucked piteously at his skirts. And Sona sat on his haunches and roared. Across the valley and up the next hill, shouted Purin Begot. Leave none behind, we follow. And we will pause there.